and thank you for joining us on our webinar today for year-end planning, uh, accounting, planning, and preparation. I'd like to start the webinar with a couple of housekeeping items. You can maximize or minimize the webinar pane during the presentation by using the red arrow buttons. During the webinar, we also encourage you to ask questions. And in the webinar pane, you'll see a chat box that you can use to enter your questions. Just type your question in and click Submit. Our presenters will answer those questions as time allows during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Second, to ensure audio quality, please check your settings to ensure that the appropriate audio option is selected. If you are using a telephone, please click on the phone call audio option. Or if you're listening through your computer, then please click on the computer audio option. Now, I'd like to present a quick review of our California CPE requirements. To qualify for California CPE, you must use a personal computer, no smartphones, and log in with your own information and your unique URL. You need to be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. You also need to actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions and complete the evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. So, with that, I would like to introduce you to our presenters. On our webinar today, we have David Miller. David is the Director of Outsource Finance and Accounting with more than 25 years of experience providing superior client service and support to emerging and growing businesses. His expertise is focused on the business needs of the client and translating those requirements into actionable financial and accounting solutions. We also have Nikki Rahimi with us today. After earning her CPA license, Nikki joined Armenino's equity management solutions practice as a consultant. She's worked with a number of clients implementing their stock plans on cloud solutions, completing stock-based compensation calculations, and supporting them through Armenino's full equity compensation outsource solution. So before we start, I would just want to go through the learning objectives. During our webinar, participants would learn to discuss key compliance requirements and forms, analyze year-end tasks to prepare for your 2017 audit, review current processes and identify areas of internal controls and compliance improvements, and identify the key components of a successful business plan for 2017. So with that, let's get started with our first polling question. And please remember, we have uh, four questions and you have to answer three out of those four. So what are your top financial concerns heading into year end? Um, is it A, understanding new or updated compliance requirements, B, understanding tax consequences related to equity compensation, C, preparing for my 2017 year end audit, or D, understanding my cash flow requirements for 2018, or all of the above. So again, remember, for to get CPE uh, credit, you need to answer at least three out of the four questions with, that we have in our presentation today. I'm excited to see the results. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to close our poll in three, two, one. Well, it seems like we are doing a good job with having our webinar uh, this afternoon. So understanding new or updated compliance requirements is the highest percentage in, in all options. So let's get started with our content. You're in compliance. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to David. Hey, good morning, everybody. So uh, let's, let's begin with payroll. And let's talk about what's changing, and the good news is not as much as last year. So until 2017, employers had two dates to keep in mind when remitting the W-2s. January 31st was to provide employee copies, and February 28th was for paper filing submitted to the Social Security Administration, or March 31st for electronic filings um, in 2018. So um, this year, uh, as you can see by the slide, 
both the electronic filing and the paper filings are due by January 31st, 2018. Um, and this is really to ensure, um, this was put in place to really sort of help prevent identity theft and, and other fraudulent activities that are going on. Now this is the federal deadline. State filing requirements vary state by state. At the highest level now, about 21 states, which is up from about 10 last year at this time, um, have adopted um, have adopted this this filing mandate. So you're going to have to check your your uh, state registrations uh, or your state uh, compliance uh, responsibilities as well. Now, if you're unable to make the deadline of January 31st, there needs to be a form 8809 filed in order to request a 30-day extension for the deadline. If you fail to file the W-2s on time, there are penalties. So the IRS can assess a penalty of up to, um, it actually ranges from a, a low of $50 up to $260 per form. And there are some caps uh, based on the size of business that you are. Uh, for small businesses, there's maximum penalty, penalties um, for some of the penalties as low as $536,000 a year. Um, and the, the penalty cap for the big businesses, larger businesses goes up to almost $3.2 million a year. So the fines basically vary, vary depending on when you're filing. So if you're filing within 30 days of the due date, it's, it's basically a $50 penalty per form. If you're filing more than 30 days after the due date, but before August 1st, um, that fine is $100 per form with the maximum penalties um, of up to $1.6 million for big businesses and $536,000 for small businesses. And then if you file your W-2s after um, August 1st, it's $260 per form, um, and those caps are a, uh, about a million dollars for small businesses and $3.2 million for the big businesses. So the penalties can add up quickly, and it's very important you stay on track. Let's go to the next slide. So the next one, the 1099 form. So just as a quick refresher for many of you out there, the 1090 form is a series of documents the Internal Revenue Service re refers to as information returns. There's a number of different types of 1099 reforms that report various types of incomes, everything from medical and health care payments to royalties um, to proceeds paid to an, uh, paid to an attorney. Um, but the, the one that is most important and of focus of this uh, webinar today is really the change um, that relates to uh, the non-employee compensation. And this change is pretty consistent with um, what was changed last year, uh, but basically for the non-employee compensation, which is typically box seven, um, which is box seven on the uh, 1099 form, it relates to uh, non-employee compensation, annual amounts of $600 or more paid to an independent contractor um, where, they do, where you do not withhold tax, taxes and an independent contractor doesn't meet any other employee criteria. So as you can see, the filing deadlines is January 31st for recipient copies um, and also for the um, electronic uh, filing copy as well. Uh, or sorry, the e, the, sorry, the due date for the e-filing is actually April 2nd, 2018. But the individual paper files um, must be out by, if you're filing by paper, they must be out by January 31st, 2018. And as very much uh, as it happens with the, um, as also it happens with the W-2s, there are penalties that range from $50 a form um, all the way up to uh, $260 per form. Okay, let's go to the next update. So the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is in place again for both 2018 as we head into the next year and was in place for all of 2017 um, in spite of all the news and media attention that it attracted. So, uh, so who qualifies for these Affordable Care Act compliance filings? Employers with 50 or more full-time employees or FTE, so full-time equivalents, right, and related employers that have more than 50 employees on a consolid consolidated basis, meaning if you've got multiple entities that consolidate up to, a, to your entity and, and the sum of those entities adds up to more than 50 employees, you, may be, you will be responsible for filing um, 
the uh, Affordable Care Act compliance forms. Um, so the reporting deadlines, and the one thing to highlight on here is that the the percentage um, for calculation for the employees uh, for the employee health care benefits is calculated as a percentage of an employee's gross income. The affordability percentage is decreasing. That percentage is going down from 2018. Sorry, from 2017 to 2018. So let's go to the next slide. Now let's talk about what has to be filed. So you must send your employees their 1095C uh, by January 31st, 2018 if you're not filing electronically or by April 2nd if you are filing electronically, right? The 1095C is a statement that provides detail about the coverage offered to the employee, the lowest cost premium available to that employee, and the months of the year when the coverage was available. All employees are eligible for coverage uh, should get a 1095C regardless of where they actually participate in the employer's health plan. Forms became mandatory back in 2015. The other form is the 1094C, which is essentially a cover sheet for all the 1095, uh, 1095C forms. Uh, it's the employer, includes information about the employer and that information as well. Um, so the IRS filing deadlines, the really important thing to know here is the due date for filing the 2017 forms for the 1094B, 1095B, 1094C, 1095C with the IRS is February 28th if you're not filing electronically or April 2nd, 2018 if you are filing electronically. Okay? And then again, penalties can add up quickly. So if you are late, it's $260 per return and $100 return can add up to uh, a whopping $26,000. So please be mindful of these deadlines. Let's go to the next slide. So again, a lot of press back and forth, a lot of information about the um, what was happening with the um, overtime thresholds. So essentially, nothing has changed. Um, uh, has changed the anticipated minimum salary requirement increase proposed back in 2016 was overturned. Um, it stayed overturned this year. Uh, the new administration is looking at what it's going to be, but basically the exempt status threshold is still at $23,660 per year uh, or $455 per week. But you have to be careful because some states will have their own minimum thresholds. For example, in California, that threshold uh, continues to be two times uh, two times the the, uh, the the federal threshold, so it's basically about forty three thousand dollars for employers with twenty six or more employees. So it's really important to know to look at the state requirements in addition to the federal requirements. But there is no federal mandate or federal change at this point. Okay. Um, it also go to the next slide. The other thing that's really important to do is to look at your independent contractors that you may have or your freelancers uh, um, and look at their classification and, if you, and really consult with an HR professional to really make sure that you have them properly classified. So you could be subject to um, audits or penalties or fines from uh, the, the FLSA or from the, um, or from the IRS. So please consult with an accounting professional and or an HR professional to make sure that you're, qual you're classifying your um, employees and non-employees in the proper way. Next slide. Nikki, over to you. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, so the next few slides are going to cover tax planning for stock options. And one of the primary um, areas um, that our clients will have to deal with in the next uh, couple months is um, the guidance in Section 6039 of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and essentially under 60, Section 6039, we have the 3921 statements uh, for uh, incentive stock option exercises and 3922 statements for employee stock purchase plan exercises or purchases, um, respectively. So with employee statements for both forms, um, these are due by January 31st of next year. Um, this is as per standard, no changes since last year. Uh, company filings are due either February 28th if you're doing paper files or March 31 for electronic filings. 
As with any um, submission of uh, filings, uh, there are penalties for late filings with IRS. As you can see here, we've got $15 per form if you file within 30 days of the deadline, maximum $75,000 per year. 30 per form if you file by August 1st, with a maximum of $150,000, um, and, and, and then so on. So $50 after August 1st, and the maximums increase. Um, so it's good to have your planning in place uh, starting now. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, the nice thing with ESPPs is that you may have already completed your purchases for the year. I have a client that recently completed it in November. So with those, um, you don't have to wait for the end of the year to start putting together the data for the forms. Um, with 3921s, you'll have to wait until you have all your exercises in exercises in for the year, but you can at least start to put together your data. Um, you know, we're almost at the end of the year at this point, so you should have most of your exercises. Um, a lot of clients are going to use vendors uh, to process the statements. So again, now is a good time to reach out to them, get data uh, coordinated, have your plans in place and your calendar set out uh, to make sure you hit all the deadlines. Another big area that a lot of clients uh, forget about or kind of bypass is reviewing for disqualifying dispositions, and that's with both ISOs and ESPP options. Um, we recommend uh, putting together an, a disqualifying disposition survey um, and starting to get a feel for who has already exercised, and not just within this current calendar year, but in prior years. Um, you want to follow up to make sure um, whether they've sold, transferred, or gifted within the disqualifying um, uh, period. So this would be two years after an ISO is granted and one year after the ISO is exercised. So both situations. Um, same deal for ESPP options. Um, and in this case, your grant date um, would be normally the beginning of your purchase um, period. So with these... Um, Disqualifying dispositions, there are some exceptions um, with transfers. So um, if you transfer to a spouse, joint tenancy brokerage account, um, via divorce or after your death or, or after death um, of the option holder, exerciser, uh, <laughs> person who exercises, uh, these would not be considered disqualifying dispositions. So payroll considerations. So payroll is going to be your best friend throughout the year um, to get all your documents put together for the W-2s, um, determining income, et cetera. Um, so make sure you're in touch with your payroll team often and continuously through the end of the year and, in, and into next year as statements are going out. Um, make sure to review exercise statements to ensure fair market values are accurate to each exercise date and coordinate this as far as getting um, the proper data in the statements before they're sent out. Um, another good thing to check for is um, whether any 83B elections were made um, during the year we were re related to restricted stock or early exercise. Um, so make sure you have that inventory handy um, and you can apply um, to the various um, if, uh, taxing events to make sure you're, um, you're, you're properly applying the right rates. Um, definitely coordinate with your payrolls um, schedule. So make, see if you could get together and, and set up a, a shared calendar. Um, make sure everyone's involved and communicating often. Um, if you have international payroll, um, get them on board as well. Um, so things like incorrect rates obviously limits uh, can lead to um, important payroll differences, and you won't have to. You don't want to have to deal with that after the fact, um, and and deal with having submit amended forms. So always check information with your payroll team. Um, go through, uh, you know, a few iterations, uh, double checking, uh, get your details out to your payroll team one last time before statements are sent out. Um, similar with uh, international employees, uh, make sure you're coordinating with your HR team. Um, understand the individual implications for these employees and whether they're going to be considered under U.S. Uh, tax. Bottom line, just do everything you can to avoid preparing amendments, if at all possible. And then in addition to the 6039 and some of the ISO requirements, um, here are some other compliance considerations to, 
to make sure uh, as you go through your year-end checklist. Number one on the list is the, really the W-9 forms, which is really that form that re requests a taxpayer identification number um, from any of your from any of your vendors. It's really important to have that on file, and this will absolutely support your 1099 filing requirements. Now, if you're a business uh, doing a lot of business-to-business -business sales uh, versus business-to-consumer sales, you want to make sure that you have a resale certificate on file um, so that if you are reselling products or selling business-to-business, -business, you want to make sure that, you wanna make sure that um, uh, you're not going to be liable for any sales tax. The other thing to consider, as you can see on here, is um, are your state registrations up to date? Um, are you registered in all the states? Have you recently expanded into new states or municipalities? Something happened within the last 30 days where you may, you may have created some uh, state and or sales tax nexus in a particular location. So make sure those filings and registrations are up to date for both sales tax and state registrations. Um, are you planning to move business, uh, move your business next year? Be, get ready for that. Make sure you're, you're planning your registrations in advance. Then the other thing to think about is, is all of your property equipment, furniture, and fixtures properly documented to support your business property tax filings, right? So a lot of time, most, most of those business property tax filings are based on the information, uh, your, your current tax is based on informa information from the historical year. So you want to make sure that your accountant um, has adequately uh, recorded and captured all of those biz uh, business property elements. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, if you're uh, if you're not an independent business, or if you're an independent business, and you're going past um, and you're going past um, and you're going past uh, um, going getting ready for an audit, you should be thinking about some other things. Let's take a look at the next poll question. All right. So again, remember you need to answer three out of the four polling questions uh, to get CPE credits. And our second polling question is, how often do you review stock-based accounting assumptions as needed, monthly, quarterly, annually, or all of the above? Nikki, how often do you see this happen? Oh, well, and I think it's kind of a trick question because we have as needed and all of the above. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think that is the million dollar question because we do have folks that wait until the last year to update their assumptions and it's not always a, a fun thing to deal with. <laughs> it can be very painful. So we say as often as you can. So when I, you know, as needed is and all of the above <laughs> probably covers it. So let's see what answers we got. Oh, so all right, good. there you go. So <laughs> as needed and all of the above. Quarterly seems to be pretty high as well there. Yeah. And I think at the least, you know, so if you're doing your regular checks, um, you know, having, you know, monthly maybe overkill if you're doing quarterly reports, but get your quarterlies in and then of course as needed. So when you're granting options, when you have important events like modifications, repricings, et cetera. So good to hear everyone. And with that, I'll go into uh, reviewing key stock-based compensation accounting inputs. Um, and so we'll move away from tax in this section. Um, so aside from daily maintenance and preparation of stock comp expense, make sure you're reviewing key policy elections every year. And, and this would be, you know, of course, again, as needed, but, um, you know, I won't go on to, into all the details here, but items like approaches for re requisite service period, amortization method, and pricing models should be analyzed before the end of the year um, and in preparation for the new year. Uh, regardless of the pricing model you're using, make sure you review valuation assumptions and have your inputs properly updated for year-end. And we've added in ASU 2016-09 here, and it's an example of, of guidance that should be reviewed um, to support key decisions for the coming year. 2016-09 um, came out last year, but it's, it's one that's still relevant, and I'll just speak to it in more detail in the next uh, later slide. All right, so our requisite service period. So again, I won't go into all the details of approach here, but um, it's one of the policy decisions to review, um, you know, every year, um, making sure that, you know, you're consistent in approach. So it's uh, requisite service period is going to be the time over which you're going to be amortizing your stock compensation expense. 
and generally we were talking about a service period that aligns to vesting schedules. Uh, you have an employee, you're going to allow them to vest over four years and that's their service period. They're going to, they have to stay employed during that, those four years. Um, sometimes uh, we'll give them a vesting start date that's before grant date. Uh, so, and that's usually the case, uh, board minutes aren't approved until a couple months after the person comes on board, so you allow that, them those couple months of service um, to achieve, um, you know, receive those shares by the time they join. So a decision has to be made whether to use the vest start or the grant date to accrue from. Uh, normally we go with the grant date and then we kind of do a, 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 an assumption on the first tranche or the first cliff, that's normally the case. Um, but Regardless of which direction you go, make sure you're applying um, your approach consistently and it's supportable. All right, so amortization. Um, you know, again, this is similar with the service period. How are you going to amortize your stock comp expense? Uh, normally straight line, single life uh, for U.S. based co companies. So you're going to be uh, generally following the vesting schedule, and if it, uh, a vesting schedule evenly vests shares over, let's say, the four-year period, then you're going to accrue expense evenly over those four, four years. Um, of course, when you do have uh, shares that vest, and let's say you have a 30% vest up front with 70% over the remainder, you're going to you know, want to uh, take enough expense for that 30%, so at least what's vested. Um, most, mostly with IFRS, uh, you're going to be going with a graded or a front-loaded expense um, with a multi-life, so a, a valuation for each tranche, whereas with single life, you're valuing the whole option in one shot, so all tranches have the same value. So again, this is something to take a look at, analyze. Most U.S.-based companies are not going to have to deal with this, but make sure you have it laid down, um, and I'll talk about pre preparing an ASC 718 memo. Oh, anyway, let's go back one more. I think we, yeah, expected term, yes. So expected term is probably one of our first inputs as far as, aside from fair market value and, and the option price, our next step is to determine expected term for the options. Um, again, uh, at least once a year, but I think we should say as granted, um, as we said in our, our survey here. Um, the uh, decision is applied prospectively, so depending on the methodology you go with, um, you want to decide and apply through the year. Um, and, and most clients are going to use a SAB 107 simplified method. Um, it's the most straightforward and well-recognized approach. Um, uh, private companies and newly public companies, um, any, any public companies that don't have a, a, you know, anyone with a limited history is fine to use SAB 107. Um, you could also make use of peer groups um, using a uh, weighted average of expected term amongst peer groups. And that would go into a historical analysis where you could you make use of that information. Um, historical analysis being evaluating how long your, your options have been outstanding over time. Um, you know, in this area, you're going to need uh, a lot more support for your approach, um, and it's good to have a conversation with your auditors early on to make sure that you're, um, you're supported in your approach. Um, if you're doing historical, we recommend excluding unvested forfeitures from the calculation and definitely include outstanding grants in the mix. Right, so volatility, and that's where we'll jump from expected term where we'll have our term ready and we're going to use our, our look back, which is the expected term, to calculate volatility. Private companies, you're not on a, uh, you're not listed on a market, so you're going to most likely use public peer groups um, to calculate volatility. Um, the one thing I've seen a lot is, uh, and this is where we come into the quarterly checks, um, and that's where it really is important where I've seen clients that have a, a, a set of public peers and they assume they're still public, but actually, in fact, one of them's gone um, private or was acquired and is no longer comparable. Um, given that you're probably not going to do four or nine A's every quarter, um, it may not be obvious that these companies are long, no longer comparable public. Um, so make sure you're checking for those. Um, the, the other thing when you're choosing peers is to make sure they have enough pricing history. Normally we say at least half the look back of the expected term. So let's say most companies have a six-year expected term. At least three years is what we're looking for. 
but then it's a case by case. And then again, as we say, gets you have enough support for your decision. Four nine A valuations, which you'll use for um, probably pulling your peers. Um, make sure you're not just going to pull. They, they these reports will include a volatility calculation based on the peers, um, which is depending. They'll have various years of look back. Um, it may not match the expected term and the grant date you're looking at, so make sure you're using your own calculations for each grant date, valuation date, and look back. Right, so we'll go, let's just go to the next one here. I got a lot more detail. Um, so forfeiture rate, and this is one where I, I spoke to 26209, and that'll be in the next slide. Um, forfeiture rate, once a year, really at the most, um, unless there's some reason to do it more often, um, the forfeiture rate should just be an annual thing. Um, and we talk about perspective versus retrospect. So you want to apply perspective. So let's say you're going to use, um, normally we'd say use a, a, a look back that is a typical vesting period. So most people will go with a four year. Uh, so at 1231, 2017, you're going to look back four years um, for your forfeiture and you, you get a percentage. Um, you apply that rate at 1118, not within the year that you're calculating the rates. Um, you're not going to want to use live forfeiture as it happens during the year to determine your rate. So you only want to have this look back information. Um, of course, eliminating any unusual transactions, uh, a one-time layoff that spiked your forfeitures, maybe not include that in your calculation. Um, and Depending on what system you're using, if you're on a, a web-based system, most likely they're going to use a dynamic application of forfeiture rates. So with this rate, understand that you're going to be smoothing out the rate. It's going to, the effective rate will go down over time until the grant is fully vested. Um, if you're doing Excel or a system that doesn't have a dynamic um, application, know that it's static. Um, the rate is applied every period until the, the shares are vested, at which that point you're truing up all the um, expense you hadn't booked because of forfeiture. Um, so making sure that's included, and I, um, if you create an ASC 718 memo, uh, make sure those details are in there. Um, that memo is going to be great when you're working with auditors um, and presenting your approach over the year. Make sure that's ready at the end of this year and moving into next year so you have your, um, your details down pat. Speaking of which, ASU 26209, you don't have to worry about forfeiture rates anymore if you adopt this uh, ASU, which is great. Um, and we've had quite a few clients that have chosen to adopt it. Um, there, I, I met, there's a couple little items here. We, there's several provisions within ASU 26209, so um, particularly with taxes, withhold to cover, um, how, presenting, and this is all related to stock-based compensation. Um, my favorite here is uh, that you can elect to apply no forfeiture rate, or rather you just book forfeitures as they actually occur. So you take a 0% forfeiture rate, you book your expense as you calculated, um, and then when someone terminates, you're going to apply the reversal of, um, of unvested expense. Um, so, you know, we definitely recommend something for you to look into if you haven't already. Um, we'll go... I think we're on to the next. Oh, yeah. Now, where the polling question here is where, um, and I'll have Sarah take over. This will be a good conversation point for 2016-09. Yes. So um, here's our question. Um, are you planning to or have you already adopted the new ASU 2016-09 guidelines? Um, yes? No? Not sure. Well, what do you curious. usually see, Nikki? I've seen a handful. I haven't seen everyone adopt it, I think, because people haven't really wanted to think about reading through it and, mm -hmm. and consider it. I mean, in one sense, once you're already doing a forfeiture rate, it's kind of harder to not do it because you do have to do um, your adjustment um, uh, life to date uh, for, the, uh, the, for not having taken the expense up to, up to date. So there's that. Um, but once you're there, it's, it's really nice. You don't have to worry about calculating the forfeiture auditors. Um, that is, I've seen that quite a bit with audits where auditors take a lot of time to try to recalculate forfeitures. And it's really challenging when you have a system that's dynamic um, and to try to you know, math out that in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet. It's really hard. So. Okay. So um, what our polling results show that 
Yeah, most of the people are not sure or they have, they're saying no. Yeah, so yeah, and then I think that that's as expected. Um, so this is where I'd say, hey, you know, just pull the, the guidance, um, take a look through. Um, there's a lot of detail in there, but, you know, I think, um, you know, you'd have to adopt the provisions. And pretty much this year is where everyone is able to, both public and private companies can uh, fully adopt the guidance. Um, so, and if you have any questions, uh, we'll have our contact information at the end. Uh, we can speak to it more for you. That was awesome, Nikki. Thanks very much. This is Thank great. Um, so, hey, so let's talk about some, um, uh, some of you may be COOs or CEOs out there and not CFOs or accounting professionals, and you may have a lot of confidence that your accountants or bookkeepers, particularly in smaller businesses, are keeping your records up to date. Well, whether you're preparing for an audit, which we have there in big, bold letters up front, or you're just getting ready for your year in taxes, it's really best to bit verify that your books are in order. Um, our best practices really say that companies should possess an electronically organized set of work papers to support all aspects of the financial statements, particularly the balance sheet. So at a minimum, we recommend the CEO or the COO review the documentation uh, on a quarterly basis with their accountant or with their um, st staff person, um, and at a minimum, they should be looking at it at year end to be confident that the books are in order. So we've kind of we've outlined some things that we feel that are very important, and the work paper should really include number one, up to date bank reconciliations, right? So you you absolutely want to make sure that all of your cash is accounted for, reconciliations of all the other balance sheet accounts. So that could be everything from uh, prepaid accounts to your fixed asset accounts to accrued liabilities for payroll taxes. We talked about payroll earlier, um, uh, and also in, also your your equity accounts too. Particularly if you're a public company or even a a private company uh, considering evaluation, you want to make sure you have your equity house in order. So you also want to make sure that you're looking at an AR aging. Um, knowing what, what, uh, how quickly you're, you're bringing cash into the organization, uh, accounts payable aging, how quickly things are going out of the organization, any accrued interest schedules, um, and also um, um, anything around prepays sort of rent or uh, some of those big commitments that, that you may have. So it's really important to have, to, to go through, to, if you're a CEO or CEO, to partner with your CFO or your accountant or your service provider and make sure that you've got uh, you've gone through those that information. And then there are some things that you need to consider going beyond the balance sheet, right? So um, is your and there's a lot of press and information, but is your customer data secure? Is it encrypted? Is it backed up? Do you have it on a desktop somewhere where someone can access it, or do you have it safely secure somewhere in a cloud or in a locker room? Um, you really want to make sure that 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 data for your customers and is your employee and your employees, your people and your clients, are those, is the data secure? Um, are, do you have good controls or good refreshing of your passwords and logins? There's really good tools out there in the, in the marketplace to help manage um, enterprise level uh, passwords. One of those is called LastPass. Um, and what happens if something goes wrong, right? Uh, there's been a lot of press in California, both in Northern and Southern California, about wildfires uh, and things like that. You want to make sure that your data is backed up. You never know when something something terrible is going to happen. So you want to make sure that you've got a disaster recovery plan in place for your business or and or for even your, your personal assets. Okay? Let's go to the next slide. We've talked a lot about um, looking back. Let's talk a little bit of m now more about looking forward. And let me just kind of set this up a little bit and really talk about um, sort of our um, how out we envision sort of the, the CFO and, and the and the CFO function really helping move the business forward. We we have this model uh, that we like to talk about, which is the the CFO Evolution Framework, which is uh, a number of uh, initiatives to help provide the roadmap for the CFO to help move forward in the organization. So today, um, many CFOs spend a lot of time in their accountant role, right, in that controller role, in that protector, making sure that bills are paid on time, the cash is collected, um, and they're really only spending a, a fraction of their time um, in that in partnering with the CEOs and COOs um, in helping move that business forward. Um, 
in, in the perfect world, in, in based on our survey and information, um, that we know that CFOs would really like to spend almost half their time uh, being part of that strategic um, organization, right? Um, uh, there's going to be all kinds of things out in the marketplace that are going to help, that are going to potentially be disruptive into the marketplace, you know, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, things like that out in the marketplace now sort of disrupting, you know, um, uh, businesses and, and uh, um, the CFO needs to really make sure that they, they have enough time and attention uh, to be that innovator and influencer uh, to focus on ha helping that organization meet the challenges that are that are coming coming ahead. So, in order to really be successful at this um, and to really sort of uh, mobilize help mobilize the CFO in that direction is really to focus on three areas: your people, your process, and your technology. And one of the really big things that can kind of help. Um, motivate and, and energize that process is the, the business planning process. So let's go, let's go to the next slide. So really one of the key things, the, really the business plan is really becomes um, uh, a tool to help the CFO and the, and the C-suite part of the organization really uh, take a step back from the day-to-day -day of what's happened this year, really um, um, take a look forward in terms of where the business needs to be going and although every business has a strategy you want to make sure that you can spend some time and convert it convert that strategy uh, into a company with tactics you want to put together a plan um, that includes multiple levels and functions of the business so that you're incorporating um, not only not only the uh, the CFO in this it should not be a CFO or accounting centric activity this is something that should involve your revenue generating part of the organization, your operational part of your organization, um, all aspects of it. Um, you want to make sure that you're including key performance indicators, the, the KPI, key performance indicators, and non-financial measures in this plan. So as you're building out this plan, you want to be um, incorporating things like maybe revenue per employee could be a, a key metric of you. You want to put a timeline around this, right? So you want to start this plan, but you also want to have an end date to the plan. The last thing you want to do is, is have something that, that can, uh, kind of continuously goes on and on without any kind of end date. You want to structure it. You want to have a start date and an end date uh, to make sure that you have, you have that. And then you use that as part of a benchmark to be able to measure your, your results going forward. And then you want to make sure that you're using not only internal data, right, your historical trend information and historical data that you have available to you, but you also want to take a look at, hey, what's going on with the, the rest of the organization? What, or sorry, what's going on with the rest of the marketplace? Um, what are the other economic indicators that are happening out in the marketplace? Um, things like the job, uh, job consumer confidence, um, job reports, things like that. Wh where, is the, where is the economy trending as a whole? So, and then from, from a CFO and from an accounting perspective, this is a great opportunity to be able to use this process to help stretch some of your accounting folks um, into another part of, into the financial planning and analysis part um, of the CFO evolution and really help with that decision support part of the process. So let's go to the next slide. So what, is, what does this business plan include, right? What are some of the outputs of the business plan? Well, the basics, right? So a profit and loss sheet, profit and loss statement, a balance sheet. Um, you want to have a sales and marketing plan that supports that, uh, the financial information, and most importantly, a cash flow, right? Cash drives the business. You want to know what, what kind of cash you're going to need to grow. You're going to, want not, you're going to want to understand what kind of cash you have to use to sort of invest in the business. And you, as, as a profitable business, you want to know how much cash you're going to be generating uh, for the business going forward. As I mentioned before, you kind of want to organize the effort as what's happening with the top line, what's happening with your revenue and sales first, focus on your expenses, what are the staff and resources that you need to be able to support that, excuse me, what are your capital requirements, so what do you need to be investing in, and then again, as I said, be able to, re to revisit this, um, you know, more than just, it's more than a plan just to sit on the top desk or on the top of somebody's desk. It's something that you should then incorporate into your, um, you know, financial measurement process. Uh, most of the cloud accounting tools out there have ways of capturing and, and once you're finished with the, the business plan, being able to, to capture and hold the financial metrics in there so you're, you're comparing against them um, on a, almost on a, on a real-time basis. Um, and I think, like, like I said, the number one, the number one 
um, from from my perspective, and the number one that we t the number one thing we talk about is really putting that plan together to really help manage and maximize uh, your cash. Okay. Good points there, David. And um, yeah, you know, my equity bit here is kind of one of those uh, bu sub bullets, I think, or fills into one of those bullets or multiple bullets um, that David presented. Um, and so, you know, as we move into 2018, it's good to have a few items to consider, you know, as far as, um, you know, the long term and, and how you're going to make use of your stock base um, compensation planning and um, really use it as an incentive for employees and others you work with, uh, vendors, et cetera. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind how and why you're utilizing equity incentive awards. And this is going to drive whether you're going to need to make updates to your option pool. And obviously, you anticipate a lot more new hires. Uh, you want to incentivize them with stock options. It's a good time to start considering, OK, let's do some increases to the pool and by how much? And what do we anticipate? What's our budget here? Um, also, compensation brackets and, and how we're going to award at different levels, you know, that's going to be, you know, I, I see a lot of clients that, you know, obviously with vesting schedules with your new hires, you're going to get that one-year cliff, four-year vest, and with recurring um, issuances to existing employees, you'll give them a little benefit and a, a quicker turnaround in investing for the options. Um, so not only that, but also um, what are the needs at each level and, and what's the best way to incentivize a new hire versus a, you know, uh, an executive or a, a salesperson. Um, there's different types of instruments and it's great, it's a great time to start looking into different ways you can approach um, offering incentives for these folks using equity. Award types, um, and in this sense, again, it goes under, you know, what type of awards are best fit each bracket or a different scenario. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out here is, um, you know, we've seen a lot of clients that have switched from options to restricted awards, um, and in, in particular RSUs, um, where the tax consequences for employees are a, a lot different. And the nice thing with options is they're not necessarily taxed until they exercise. Um, with restricted awards, you're going to be taxed at every best. Um, so having this in mind, um, putting in, and I'll go in the, in the next bullet here with employee education, getting together facts and uh, FAQs, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, webinars, information sessions, um, maybe get feedback for employees about switching to, say, an RSU for an option, and also um, informing them of the instruments, the tax consequences, how to exercise, things like that. Um, it's going to really help with just the maintenance of your stock plan, um, relieve some from time, time off your hands as an administrator or your admin team um, to field a lot of questions. You're also going to avoid issues down the line where um, you have uh, folks complaining about tax bill, you know, a big tax bill, and uh, are not knowing how to exercise an option and, and doing it incorrectly. So, it's a great time now to get that all put together and ready for 2018. Okay, uh, thank you, Nikki. And with that, we are on our last polling question. Again, I just want to remind everyone that you need to answer this one if you missed any one of the questions that we showed before. So, which statement below is critical to the completion of a best practice 2018 business plan? Is it personal plan, a uh, personnel plan, excuse me, balance sheet, cash flow statement, or all of the above? It's a little bit of a tricky. It's a little bit of a tricky question, but hopefully everyone's been carefully paying attention. <laughs> well, we're going to close the poll in three, two, one. All right. So, all of the above. <laughs> the, the the lion's share. So, for for those of you who who didn't, um, who, uh, who thought uh, the, the personnel plan was not important is, I, I didn't use the word personnel, I used resources, but it's really important that you know what your staffing is going to be to make sure that you get to that next level. Um, yeah. So, all right, guys. Um, well, we're, I'm just going to conclude our webinar. Um, we, with that, we are at the end. And so during this webinar, we covered a lot of different topics. Uh, we covered uh, U.S. tax and reporting considerations, 6039 compliance, payroll considerations, disqualifying disposition. We also covered accounting items for year-end, policy elections, 
expense assumptions, and we also talked about system updates, FASB updates, and business plan best practices. So what we're going to do is going to open this up to you guys. Uh, so what questions do you have? We got a few while we uh, while David and Nikki were presenting, so I'm just going to go with the first ones. Um, so I think, David, this would be for you. In addition to sending W3s and W2s to the IRS, what if we use a paperless online payroll service um, is notifying the employees that W2s are available enough to meet compliance? Or are we required to physically mail W2s to employees? So typically, uh, uh, typically what we've done is if, um, typically what we've done is uh, employees can opt in to receive an electronic filing copy, uh, but they do have to opt in. If you don't have that process in place with your with your employees, uh, then you are required to make sure that they get a paper copy. Okay, great. Um, we also got a question which says, as an employer, what are requirements for sending 1095s to employees? We have only nine employees. So for nine employees, you're not required to submit the 1095s. It's really only for employers with more than 50 employees or 50 full-time equivalents. So for the person who asked about the nine employees, um, my only question is do you have um, other part-time employees that add up to, to more than 50? If it's just you have nine employees, then, then you're good. You don't, you're not required to file. All right. And then, Nikki, we have a – couple questions for you too. Um, what happens when someone exercises but holds shares with an ISO? What are the tax consequences? Right. Yeah, with, um, so if you're exercising and holding, um, there's no withholding, so there's not going to be any income statement or, or anything uh, that would go to the employee, no 39, well the 3921, I'm sorry, would go out still, um, and then the company doesn't take a deduction. Um, as far as whether it's immediately, in, so if they exercise and hold, you send them the 3921s, as far as their tax preparation, this is subject to an alternative minimum tax. Um, so I normally recommend, you know, when, when we have clients that email us and say, hey, my client, employees are asking about what, how to deal with these incentive stock option 3921 statements, uh, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a tax preparer, but I always say, you know, there's AMT consequences. Have them speak to their tax preparer um, and, and determine the impact. Okay. And also another question is, how are non-qualified options taxed? Yeah, so we, we talk a lot about the 3921s, ISOs, ESPPs, and qualified uh, stock options, but with non-quals, um, at, at exercise, the spread is ordinary income. Um, the company takes a deduction, a deduction at exercise, and so the employee, um, if it's an employee, um, the company's going to withhold. Uh, Non-employees, you're going to send a 1099 miscellaneous. Um, and one thing you can consider, I know, because it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a burden when someone exercises and they have to pay for both the tax and the cash um, to pay the strike price, you know, to to purchase the shares, um, uh, we we recommend if you if you'd like to consider doing cashless exercises where all or part of the taxes um, or even the exercise price um, are uh, covered by shares. So there's a with, withholding of shares to uh, cover the burden of the tax. Okay. Um, another question for David. Um, we are partnered with a PEO for recruit record retention and other compliance, which party, our PEO partner or us, is required to store, maintain payroll related documents, history such as the 1941s, etc., W2, W3, and for go on further on. Your, your PEO, it's going to uh, depend a little bit on the structure of your PEO, but most PEOs are responsible for all of those um, all of those filings, all of those requirements, it's really going to depend on the agreement that you've made with them. If you are receiving, um, if those employees are not on your payroll but are on the payroll of the, uh, of the PEO, they are absolutely responsible. If the employees are still part of your entity uh, but the PEO is managing it, your arrangement may be that they are responsible for filing that information. Um, but ultimately, you as the entity will be, would be accountable for any fines in the event that they miss any of those deadlines. Okay, great. 
And a lot of you guys are asking, uh, will we be sharing our presentation? And the answer is yes, a link will be sent within 48 hours after our today's presentation. So keep a lookout for that in your inbox. Yep, the other thing I would say, Sarah, is because uh, I know there's some questions on tax impact, um, and I know there's an upcoming webinar on December 20th about from uh, with uh, Jerry Clancy, one of our tax partners. So if folks want more information, it might be uh, prudent for them to um, uh, sign up for that one as well. Yes, definitely, and um, we will be um, having that webinar. We could sign up for the webinar the same way we signed up for this one. And so if you guys have any questions or would like to talk to David or Nikki um, and, you and want to know more about the topic that we discussed today, then here's their contact information. And yeah, feel free to email them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we'll look forward to the further questions you guys have. Glad to answer any follow-ups. Yep, same here. Really look forward to uh, hearing from any of you. Please feel free to email us or, or call us on the phone. All right. Again, thank you for joining our webinar. Thanks, everybody.